we're really excited to be here. Um, uh, this is a time when artists, cultural minorities, cultural heritage and expressions are increasingly under attack. Um, uh, and defending the cultural rights of communities has arguably never been more important. And that's really the context for our conversation together, and we really hope with you as, as well. Um, so there will be me. I will also be joined um, shortly on this screen by um, Dr. Unjabulo Chipangura, who was previously research fellow and curator at uh, Bits University in Johannesburg, South Africa, and hot off the press, folks, I am truly delighted to say, is the new curator of living cultures here at Manchester, at Manchester Museum. So Njabu is going to be joining us. Um, uh, and also uh, Joelle Taylor, uh, a brilliant poet, is going to be joining us as well. And together, what we really want to do is we want to explore new inclusive narratives and perspectives and experiences and how spaces like museums can really support and champion Article 27. Uh, but I tell you what, let's start with the art, let's start with the words. So I'm going to invite Joelle to come up and do just that. Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you all here. Um, so I was asked to respond to one of the declarations, one of the articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I chose Article 27, which relates to the preservation of our distinct cultures and our communities. And it's a sequence of poems, so it's quite long, so I'm splitting it into two parts, and this is the opening part. It's called The Quiet Men. Quietly, they come. Today, the quiet men came. They banned poetry, and the children laughed through their fictional satchels into the sky, and when they landed, they were uniforms that fit the children perfectly. Those whose bodies were coloured outside the lines were left in the offcuts. The key is to keep your arms inside the hemlines, ration your breathing, pull everything in and hold. Today, the quiet men came. They cauterized language. An open-backed truck shuddered through town, collecting the elders' tongues, those <coughs> misshapen or blunt, those that speak with a limp. They wriggled together in a net on the metal floor, gasping for words, an idea in a different language. And all the children waved at the convoy of trucks heading out of town not knowing they would now not understand their names. <clears throat> Today, the quiet men came. They cut the dance from us, hung it from wire coat hangers where it took the wind as its partner. They left strict moves in its place, the right way to turn, to dip, the correct distance apart, how to negotiate instinct. Our bodies no longer knew how to speak, though the floor is palimpsest, the hieroglyphics of dance rising in our dreams. In the white of day, when we play music, no one moves. We just wait for the next beat. Today, the quiet men came. They pasted warnings over our paintings. Artworks deleted themselves, and now gaudy frames wrap silence as we exhibit our ignorance. The public gallery hung with artists. The children gathered, ate crisps, wondered at the magnificence of the artist's eye, how the real art is in the swing of shadows against the marble floor. Oh, quiet men, heart of a ballpoint pen, clicking, spreadsheet grin, tick box mouth. Oh, quiet men with their quiet rubbers, erasing faces, whole bodies, the first story. So now the town is filled with quiet children, summoning parents, snapping the arms of spectacles, burying language to the net, folding the stage into an origami general. 
and the bars in school exercise books are now bars on prison cells, and the new dance step is a marching boot, and the poetry is not poetry at all. The poetry is an empty room with a light bulb swinging to the Museum of Museums. <clears throat> The children visit the Museum of Museums, weaving through display case rubrics, clutching pamphlets as hard as a mother's hand. They gather their faces together and peer at the dusty exhibits trapped and stuffed behind glass. A pub at closing time. Anchor Watt, the National Theatre. A child frozen in the act of thinking. A typewriter with the letter I. Thank you. And I'll read the rest of the poem later. Thanks very much. Ooh. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Joelle. Well, Pleasure. the Museum of Museums. OK. Um, uh, tell us a bit more about what inspired the poem. Where did that come from? <laughs> I mean, uh, OK, so I think that um, whenever authoritarian governments, whenever authoritarian ideologies take control, the first mm -hmm. people you need to control are the artists and the educators. Those mm -hmm. are the two things. Um, and I took a trip. Um, I took a trip to see Angkor Wat in Cambodia in 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was literally all I was going for. We were very clear that we weren't going to visit any killing uh, fields or anything like that. But the reality when we got there was very, very different. So everybody around us kept urging us to go and see these... I don't know if anyone's ever been, but um, these quite horrific kind of monuments to mass murder and genocide. And then they were, I guess, the children of the people who were first affected, or the grandchildren, and they told stories about what happened. So when I'm saying they snapped the arms of spectacles, mm -hmm. very language to the neck. So I'm really fascinated mm -hmm. at the way that, um, a way that ideologies take control. And I had a phrase for it, it's called Songs My Enemy Taught Me, which is um, a quote from a Cambodian woman when we mm -hmm. said, how did you, they empty the cities in, in something like two or three days? How did they do that? And she mm -hmm. said, oh, it's easy. Songs my, our enemies taught us. So all the children came out and the schools mm -hmm. singing these kind of um, Khmer Rouge songs. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was it, really. And just the real importance of retaining our distinct cultures, mm -hmm. you know, um, and investing in them. Mm -hmm. And culture is such a, a powerful narrator. So mm -hmm. the you know one of the things we wanted to do was thinking about the who gets to tell the stories, whether that's in our museums, our cultural institutions. Yeah. In terms of, of of your work, you're telling all sorts of stories. How how um, you know you're commissioned to do those? How do you how do you navigate all of this? <laughs> um, I mean, it's you know it's instinct. So mm -hmm. much of what we do. Mm -hmm. So my new book, Kanto, is yeah. all about preserving LGBTQ plus history mm -hmm. and lost stories, particularly the stories of um, butch dykes, mm -hmm. for want of a better word, that's what we call ourselves. Um, and um, so, so really it's, I don't know. I don't know where a poem comes from. I've got no idea. It's just kind of there suddenly. Um, and it's sort of the poem teaches the poets what they're thinking, kind of. A little bit. So, I mean, I think it's vital that we preserve our narratives, that we own our narratives. Mm -hmm. And it's vital for a lot of reasons, um, not just in terms of our self kind mm -hmm. of awareness, not just in terms of children. Um, it's at the core of everything mm -hmm. as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm um, certainly, you know, someone who runs a museum, my sense is those narratives have been quite limited. So when you look at the breadth of perspectives mm. that actually come to the fore within our museums, the stories we tell over many decades, they have been deeply familiar stories, often from one perspective. Mm. So one of the things we've been doing a lot of work around is thinking about the different perspectives, particularly when you hold global collections mm. that you might start to bring to the fore. Um, and, and then that work around, you know, how you bring that lived experience to the heart of the storytelling of you as a museum. Yeah, I mean, because museums are kind yeah. of at the centre, aren't they, of, of our kind of imperialist mm. history, mm. and it only tells one story. Mm. I mean, it's actually the same 
thing being exhibited over and over again. If you want to extend that, you know, and it's the consequence of colonialism, of genocide and murder. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, where do you go with that? Yeah, well, I think the 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 kind of uh, that sense of the colonial context. I mean, I'm I'm at Manchester Museum. It's a colonial endeavour, mm. absolutely. And I suppose at its sort of its most extreme in the museum world it are the collections which we have in our museum as a result of colonial violence. So, um, I, I mean, I think I, last time I spoke to you, I was explaining how we're a bit of an outlier in the museum world in in the UK at least because. We have repatriated, for example, collections to Aboriginal communities, so secret, sacred and ceremonial items that we absolutely know came to our museum as a result of colonial violence. Mm. And the thing that's really struck us is, in a way, our thinking about our collections is quite rational. It's sort of, it's, it's come from a place of Western rationalism. But the minute you actually work with the people who are most closely connected to those collections, so in this case, this was particular Aboriginal communities, their relationship to this material is spiritual. Mm. It's embodied. And, and actually, we are grappling with how do we find a way to make room for the emotional as institutions, how do we do that? And if I'm honest, I kind of think museums are in a bit of a moment of existential crisis as they're really trying to reconcile themselves with their uh, colonial past. Yeah, I mean, I really love that idea. You're saying, how do you, how do you display an emotion? Just the, you know, absence in a, in a kind of, you know, vitrine, a kind of display mm. case is really fascinating to me. Mm. Um, but, but mm. you know, um, so what was the experience of when you handed the stuff? What happened? Yeah, so it it was a long. So it was in partnership with an incredible organisation called AATSIS, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, um, and it, it's a long process. So you know, working together for for eighteen months, um, we had identified with them forty three secret, sacred, and ceremonial items. We worked on the research around the provenance. We built a case with them for the need to return. Our return is fairly um, unusual, it's unconditional. So what it does is it fully acknowledges that the ownership and the right to that material sits with those Aboriginal communities. It's not us uh, returning with any conditions um, because let's face it, that would be that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, it was returned. And actually, we, we, it's, for me, so much of the conversation in museums is about when it comes to repatriation is framed about loss. And it's got it completely wrong. Yeah. Because actually, it's all about what you gain. So new relationships, new insights, new perspectives. Manchester Museum is actually closed at the moment. We'll reopen next year. There will be a whole display in partnership with those Aboriginal communities about life after repatriation. Wow. And actually they talk about cultural revitalization as critical to the life of the object. And actually it's a really perfect moment to bring in um, an Anjabu, um, uh, who I hope is gonna, as if by magic, appear on a screen. Um, aha, there we go, mm. hi Anjabu. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi, How's great. I am um, yes. just talking. I don't know whether you heard that in Jabu, but I was talking about kind of cultural revitalization. And yeah. it just struck me, you've been doing such interesting work in Zimbabwe. Can you just mm. talk to us a bit? And I'm thinking particularly about the work you've done with uh, that collection of traditional drums. Can you just tell us a bit about the work you've been doing? Thank you, Esme. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I, I have worked as a curator of archaeology at Mutere Museum. It's a very small museum in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, which was opened in 1964 as a result of the kind of colonial violence that Esma was referring to. So most museums in Africa, they were established during colonization. So the collections that were taken to the museums represented Western rational epistemologies. So by that time, they were collecting traditional drums that belonged to a Shona community called Wesa. It was more like appropriating from the community without their consent and in the process ignoring their social biographies. So these objects were placed in dioramas, in glass cases in 
ectomotarians yeah, with no contextual information whatsoever. Mm. The only place there for the aesthetic value, they look so beautiful in the eyes of those we are collecting. So after independence, 23 years after independence, I took on the job of being a curator and then we had to rethink or reconfigure this collection to give it meaning, right? So I wanted to actually understand the kind of stories that the communities hold on these drums. Mm -hmm. Apart from them just looking beautiful in the eyes of the collectors, we wanted to invoke the biographies. These objects were living in a sense within communities. Mm -hmm. In an African context, objects are created not for how beautiful they look, but they're creating, created for contemporary use, maybe ritual, spiritual, or any other uses. So I wanted to bring back the story that was silent when the museum was opened. So I undertook an exhibition collaboratively with the Western communities. We went out there, we asked them what they understood about this particular drums that was in Mutari Museum. And ironically, we also found similar drums that were still being used in the community. So from there, we tried to co-produce a narrative that was previously excluded when these drums were put into the museum. Mm -hmm. So we used the category of co-production or co-creative as a decolonial methodology in trying to bring silent voices that were marginalized by colonial violence in the museum. So the story was retold with the active participation of the community. Mm -hmm. I was the curator, but we shared authority in producing the new narrative that ended up telling what the ritual aspect of this drums were. So it came in as a new kind of way of interpreting, reinterpreting these traditional drums, which had spiritual significance, ritual significance, which in the past was excluded mm -hmm. by colonial violence or by the museum of the colony. Mm -hmm. So post-colonial museum practices called in for the coming in of narratives from the communities, working together with the curators, shared authority, democratizing the museum space and allowing people to tell stories from their own perspectives, which were previously marginalized because of colonialism. Mm -hmm. So the exhibition went out well and up to now still running the entire museum with quite a big involvement of the local community. Yeah, and it's it's really um, so. And, and Jabba and I, as you might imagine, have talked quite a lot about uh, what we in our world call co-production or co-creation. And I suppose one of the things we've been reflecting on is is the shift in in what a curator does, which of course they care for collections. You know, the idea of curator came from carare, meaning to care for. Um, they care for collections, but actually. If you think about that as an ethics of care, it's really about extending that to people and beliefs, ideas and relationships, as well as the material object. Um, so, and Jabi, just talk a bit more, because we, we're doing a lot of work in Manchester around that co-curation. We're, we're building a new South Asia gallery in partnership with the British Museum, but they're actually doing it co-curation on an epic scale with 31 greater Mancunians, all of South Asian heritage, none of whom have ever worked in museums, who are bringing their lived experience and their narratives and those collections together. I think it's like alchemy. That's, that's the plan. Um, but, but talk a bit more about um, uh, co-curation. How, how did that work then? And who were you actually curating with um, in, in, in relation to these, these drums, these collections? So, so we started off with, with some provenance research. We wanted to understand where exactly this collection came from. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course. No. OK. To use the same kind of okay. collection. Right? So we went out there to, to work with them in trying to reinterpret the collection in the museum. So they came through the museum. They looked at the drums. and. Immediately, they start tell, telling stories about what they know and what, are, what they're using the drums for immediately without even asking them about the collection. So already, we are using ethnography to interpret the collection. So the ethnography is coming from the contemporary people who, have, who we call source communities. They have a relationship with these objects because they can relate even up to today. So it's more or less like there's a progression in time in the use of these objects or these drums. Mm -hmm. In the past, they were used by their ancestors. And then it was passed on to generation to generation. And up to today, they're still using the same kind of drums in their ritual practices. So in that sense, we're able to amalgamate or to, inter to integrate their stories onto the main kind of storyline that the museum was mm -hmm. exhibiting. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's a decolonial approach of approaching core collaboration because we're not only talking about voices from experts. I'm an archaeologist, but then my role as an archaeologist was more like that used to allow voices from the other, mm -hmm. voices from beneath, right? 
to tell the story and we were able to document that, those stories and use them as narratives that were later on appended mm -hmm. on the one mute object. Because remember I said from an African context, objects they don't just they're not just made for for aesthetic beauty or for mm -hmm. how they appear. They have an inside value, use value. They live, you know, they live, they breathe. They have this living component which was not there when they were collected and placed mm -hmm. in the dioramas and in the glass cases. They were collected violently and they were imprisoned for almost 35 years. Oh. And then there come this new exhibition where companies were now telling the stories on how they're using the same kind of drugs right now. So from that moment, we can start thinking about co-producing, which means myself as a creator, I have to see some kind of power and allow the community to speak to these objects yeah. and write the stories for themselves by themselves. So that way, it's a decolonial methodology yeah. called co-curatorship or yeah. co-production, which most African yeah. museums are trying to embrace as a result of the history of how museums were formed in Africa. Yeah, there's a real shift in, in, in practice in African museums, which I think we can learn a huge amount from. And, and I suppose one of the areas that um, thinking about the stories we tell, the narratives that we tell about the collections we hold, probably the one that some uh, may be first and foremost in the public imagination are the bronzes from Benin, um, which, uh, as many of you may know, have, there have been calls for those to be returned um, over, over decades, actually, now. Um, but, you know, this sense that we, you can go and, and observe these uh, bronzes all over the world and you will not necessarily have the full story. You will not know necessarily mm. the context of the punitive expedition, how they actually ended up in these institutions. And we're currently working with partners in Nigeria to return um, looted, because that's what it is, um, collections that we hold in Manchester. Um, and I think the thing that we really observed with this is this is an opportunity to open up a public and citywide conversation mm. about who we want to be in the world. How do we build empathy and understanding? So we have a very large tusk. It's sort of it's taller than me. It's absolutely incredible carved that was taken with force from the, um, the Obers throne um, uh, during the 1897 expedition. It is in the museum in Manchester. And we're working with partners. Um, uh, and so we, over the last 18 months, we, um, we had it on display and we asked our visitors good folk who come to the museum, um, where does it belong? <laughs> what should we do? And we've been analysing um, uh, what people think, and it's really fascinating. So uh, over 87% of our visitors are in favour of return. Um, uh, and actually, in terms of our under-16 visitors, I think we're at 100%. So there is a really, I mean, it just gives me so much hope, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. um, there is a real, a real shift. Um, but I just wanted to share one of the comments from our visitor book. So next to it, we had a visitor book. I have never seen a visitor book with so many comments. It's, it's an incredible thing. But one of the visitors said this, um, British powers stole it. Return it. <laughs> this is one of your ancestors' actions that can be done something about. Stop asking us questions and offer it to its rightful owners from the child of a former British colony. P.S. The story, however, should stay. And I just think it's such a powerful way of, of really kind of understanding the power of those stories. Um, and Jabu, just I'm interested because you've been working in, in Africa for the last oh, decade plus. Who, who's, who's doing amazing work that you've seen, whether it's in Africa or anywhere in the world, who you feel is really kind of leading the way and really bringing to the fore these new inclusive stories. Is there anyone we should know about or you want to shout about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a popular museum in Cape Town called the District 6 Museum. I think it's quite popular. It documents the histories of displacement uh, around the Cape Flats region when the Cape Colors were removed from that area to pave way for segregation during apartheid. So they were able to document the stories of how people were forcibly removed from that space and came up with a community museum called the District 6 Museum. So there are quite a number of academics in South Africa who are working at the University of Western Cape. We've been doing this kind of amazing work of trying to understand the story behind 
a subject, right? In this case, we're talking about in the absence of objects, mm -hmm. but we can still document stories of struggles and of mm -hmm. apartheid and of displacement. So there's this beautiful myth. It's all about stories. There's nothing that you see there in Abidjama. People will tell how their grandparents lost off their fields, how their mothers were removed from this place. Mm -hmm. And there is a bit of like paraphernalia objects or some kind of tissues that were taken away from that space. Mm -hmm. But the real issues around our stories are documented, our stories are also narrated or curated in the yeah. absence of yeah. real objects. So I think guys in Cape Town are doing well, University of Western Cape around the uh, District 6 Museum. It's quite an amazing museum. And then yeah. in Tanzania, Tanzania, they're also doing an amazing work in terms of coming up with community museums. Right? Some national museums are, are more or less like viewed with skepticism with communities because they have a history of violence, right? So mm -hmm. communities are now forming their own museums by themselves, for themselves, by establishing community museums. No curator whatsoever, they use indigenous curatorship. They curate for themselves with their own knowledge systems. And they come up with these beautiful museums which are far away from yeah. national museums that are run by Western kind of, of epistemological forming. So I think community museums are also emerged as an alternative yeah. way of representing local and living cultures in the absence of the national framework, which has been exclusionary for a long time. And I've seen right. amazing work in Tanzania, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. I will check out the work in Tanzania. And I know um, Dix District 6 has been doing incredible work for many, many years. Um, I'm going to just throw one in there, um, which is just the uh, and it, one of my favourite museums in the world is the Partition Museum in Amritsa, which is um, in the Punjab, which is uh, has a whole museum which is really focused on the experiences of partition. And it genuinely is a people's museum. And it has shaped every single thing they do. And I suppose one of the things that we've been thinking about is who gets to tell their story within that context. And, and so actually starting to really explore your collections. So I hope Njabu doesn't mind me mentioning this, but when um, we interviewed recently, we asked all of the curators, we gave an example from a collection in Manchester. This doesn't exist, but it could. We gave an example of something that looked a bit like a wooden club. Um, it had a, we did an imaginary label on it that just said late 19th century, West Africa. Uh, did it say Benin? I can't remember in Jabu. But anyway, we, yeah. we did that. And we asked them, you know, there you go. That's all the information you got. Over to you. <laughs> What are you going to do? And, and it was really fascinating because lots of the people we interviewed, and they were fantastic curators, there was this sense of we go to the, uh, the provenance records, we go to any of the museums, we go to the auction catalogues, and, and Jabo absolutely did that, but he did more. So, Njabo, what did you say you would do with that object? Because you, you mentioned the phrase social biography earlier, but talk a bit yeah. more about what that is. So, essentially, it means that, I mean, when, when, when objects are made, they are made as living organisms, right? They're not just made because they would want to end up being physical. So, the biography is more like the life, the life history of an object from its birth up until it's disposed. But the museums take over the disposal stage and keep the object as mute, but we want to give the story back of why was this object created? So the biographical story looks at the reason why the object was made, right? Because there was an idea before the object became tangible. So what is the intangible story of the object that is going to be embraced and connected to its tangibility? So most of these objects, they, when they were collected by early ethnographers, early anthropologists, they were just interested in just the culture, the culture of which the ethnicity, or then looking at the deeper story of why the object was created, what were the ritual functions of the object, what are the spiritual functions of the object. So the biography now gets us back to the question of looking at the deep story of the object from the time it was created, used, and perhaps not disposed, but violently taken out of the community and placed in the museum. So we're giving it back its story in this life since this object was created for a purpose, and the purpose can be connected to its spiritual function or spiritual function. Yeah. And, and one of the things that really struck me was around how you build that social biography. So actually, one of the things we talked about is that you don't just go to other museum professionals. Of course, you work with source communities. You build on networks you've got, whether that's in Africa, but you also connect with diaspora communities. You know, Manchester is hyper-diverse, and you actually, together, collectively, start to build your understanding. And then those stories can be at the heart of your institution. Um, 
I'm going to open it up, though, because um, we've, been re we've been reeling between kind of restitution and repatriation, and we've been very object-focused. I'm afraid we can't help it. Museum people, we're trying to focus on the stories of people. Have you, have you got any, any questions for us? I'm hoping someone might have a, a question. <laughs> yeah, hiya. The comment you read out from the visitor book yeah. saying, yeah, return the tusk, but keep the story. Mm. So mm. I'm interested in ways you found or are thinking of to keep the story and show us the object. Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because, you know, how do you display absence? Mm. Um, so uh, I'm going to be really honest. We're, we're working it out. We're trying to work it out. And, and the thing is, we can't work it out on our own. So if you look, for example, at the, um, at the, the tusk, actually... I'm really delighted that Joelle is here, for example, because one of the ways that we found to do this is to work with poets. So uh, back in 2019, we commissioned the brilliant Inua Ellens to um, do a poem based on the tusk, which was absolutely about the story. It's, it's an extraordinary poem. It's on our, our website. Um, uh, we are working... I was with a, an artist yesterday called Victor, who's from Benin. We're thinking, do we work with contemporary artists in Nigeria at the moment who are responding to the tusk actually when it's back in Nigeria? How do we do this? And we'll work with partners across Nigeria because I think ultimately... We've got to tell the stories together. It's not... With the museum has told its story for so long. Actually, how do we create the conditions to bring in those other stories? So when you come to Manchester, hopefully to the museum, and when we reopen next year, the Tusk won't be there. But there will be something there. We aren't quite sure what yet, but there will be something. And similarly, the work we're doing with Aboriginal communities, they're coming up with some extraordinary ideas for what we might do. Everything from film through to, um, through to you know, new works, through to um, actually them working with us to look at what the equivalent of some of those secret, sacred and ceremonial items is today. So part of it, you know, the museum I run's got four and a half million objects. We've got a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, actually, this is, this is the start of something. And I don't... I, I, I'll be really honest. We're really open to ideas. <laughs> so if any of you know how we do this, I just... In, in our experience, this is just an extraordinary opportunity to kind of build a sense of connectedness and empathy um, with, essentially, communities who are really closely connected to these collections and through that connection to Manchester. And so that's what we're trying to do, is find always the way to build that understanding and empathy. And storytelling is such a powerful way to do it. Mm. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the gatekeepers of stories mm. because in this country, the stories that we are told are still told through a lens of white people predominantly. Yep. It's one of the poorest industries for actually integrating voices of people of colour. How do you feel that there are ways of creating a more permanent change in that way? Because things like the project around the South Asia Gallery, yep. that will go away and those communities won't any longer be involved. So mm. I think there are lots of really great projects and lots mm. of great museums that are doing stuff, mm. but the permanence doesn't mm. always feel that. Yeah, and, and the kind of the classic lurching from project to project. So actually, one of the things I'm really proud of is South Asia Gallery and won't go away. Um, the curator of the South Asia Gallery, an extraordinary woman called Nusra Ahmed, she's a permanent member of staff. She'll be there as long as she wants to be there. That role is there. It will be embedded within the future of the museum. Um, and Jabba's role of curator of living cultures, that's going nowhere. It's a fundamental, foundational role for the museum. But you're absolutely right that all too often, whether it's through... You know, there are so many brilliant projects. There's a, there's a great exhibition in Ipswich at the moment called The Power of Stories. It's amazing. Actually, they're grappling with the, this is brilliant, but when the money's gone and the work with those communities has gone, what, what then? What, do we just leave people? What, 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 what's that about? How do we change this? So 
for me, the systemic bit, that's the bit I have the influence, the privilege, the power actually to be able to try and do something about that. So for me, that's about who's working in your museum, who, what those roles, we rewrote the role that Njabu um, has gone for. We rewrote the curatorial role to have a proactive appro approach to restitution and repatriation. I think it's probably the only one in the UK that does that. It's definitely out of kilter with government policy. Um, but we're in a university, and a university that really thinks about social responsibility and the next generation of global citizens. And the reason I have hope is because, you know what, change is coming. So museums, you can either step up and embrace the change, or you're, you're going to be forever behind the curve, and we miss so much. I've, I'm not answering your question, because I don't know the answer. I just know we need to keep doing the work. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, Hi. It actually follows on um, from the yeah. previous question a little bit um, in that you've just touched upon nationally funded museums mm -hmm. and some of the, well, the many challenges that does come with that. And I think what Manchester Museum is doing with South Asia Gallery is you've you are moving into the direction of centering voices mm -hmm. and people in a way that by default, that includes decentering others, mm. which could be yeah. colleagues, yeah. curators. Yeah. So my question, um, which I'm not sure if you can answer um, or would be comfortable to answer, but have you had any challenges, for example, board of trustees, mm. other colleagues? Mm. Because this is a shift in ways of working. Mm. Um, and as somebody who works in a nationally funded museum, mm. it's a huge mm. challenge mm. that we have because mm -hmm. we want to move forward in this new way of working, but mm. to centre yeah. communities and marginalise voices, yeah. Yeah. we have to then remove yeah. other yeah. powers. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. And I won't pretend people haven't left. Um, they have. Um, I was really explicit when I started. Um, but I don't want to think this is coming from nowhere. It's not sort of, you know, it, this is building on work that's actually been happening in Manchester for a long time. So um, the, uh, the man who was director 20 years ago, or 15, no, probably 20 years ago, um, uh, actually I spoke to at length because back in the day, in the 90s, he was the first museum director in the UK to return a whole host of human remains to um, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And as he put it, um, I was firmly on the naughty step. Um, uh, and he was like, you're going to be on the naughty step. Get comfortable with it. Um, so actually, that, um, that's in the DNA of the organisation. And ultimately, I think the governance is important because we're a university. So that commitment to academic freedom, um, to curatorial freedom, actually, to social responsibility is at the heart of our work. Engagement with the student body, the things people care about. Um, it isn't easy, but part of me also thinks, what's the alternative? We keep telling the same old stories. Mm. Um, that's the alternative. And the South Asia Gallery has had a huge change. I inherited a phenomenal project that was essentially doing a chronology, quite a traditional, I mean, very good, but quite a traditional chronology of South Asia with a performance space at the heart of it where we invite communities in to do performances and tell stories. That's not right. And actually, that missed the biggest opportunity, which is great. Manchester has an incredible diaspora. And it actually, this could be the first gallery. It will be the first gallery in the UK dedicated to diaspora and experience and contribution, not just for all of those people, but for all of us, because the insights and the understanding and that notion of what it means to be British Asian, you know, that will be at the heart of this gallery. And we know from our consultation that's of interest to all our visitors. So it's as a way of working, we stopped the project, 
We, we, um, we left our old designers because the designs we were working with, it wasn't a good fit. We had new designers. It's cost way more money. <laughs> um, uh, there are new roles, you know, all of that. But part of me thinks, you know, if you do what you've always done, then you're going to get what you've always got. Um, and I think particularly in light of the last 18 months, um, I don't know about you, but pff, no, not having it. Um, so it, it, it's, there, there feels an urgency now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I love this city. I've worked here for many, many years. I think we're very good at telling a story to ourselves in Manchester about radicalism. Um, I'm not sure we're quite as radical as we think we are. Um, uh, and so I, I, I think we've got to, to step, step up. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know whether that answered it. Just, just keep, keep doing it. <laughs> um, on that note, I think I'm going to actually, because we're, we're really mulling over what's the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, um, and I'm actually just really excited because, Joelle, I think it's time to return to the final part of your poem, which could probably not be more relevant. Great. Oops. I still haven't got used to this thing. Okay, so the second part of the poem, it focuses on the display cases that are in the Museum of Museums. So each of these things, imagine them as the, the note, you know, the, what do you call it, the curator's note underneath an exhibition. Le oh, right. <laughs> Label. <laughs> OK. In this case, reliloquy, tea time, four plates, four mugs and one bottle of Friday stout. In the background, a television shows a film of a family of four seated around a drop-leaf dinner table, their faces buffed into cinema screens on which a documentary plays of a family of four eating something that does not belong to them. In the centre of the table, beneath a silver-domed lid, there is a coal mine. Bingo, the betting shop. The dogs, pool coupons, green shields, stamps, little woods, a budgie, Findus cheese pancakes, September 1981. When the man of the house speaks, it has all been said before. When the mother speaks, she doesn't. On loan from the British Museum. <laughs> In this case, the language aquarium. Bright tongues shoal gold and ricochet, zip up the water behind them, eat one another and emerge larger, words inside words. The tongues flock as they always have, their whispers propaganda the waves. At night, they rumour of home, that there once was a body, that once had a country, that they were caught by a man using his own tongue as bait and a Coca-Cola can as a float. The children visit, bend to throw ideas into the water, as just below the surface, whitefish swarm. In this case, the vivarium of other things, things that are not us, a dance move developed in the East End, a torn bit of speech, a panic of graffiti, music, with non-anglophone beats, strands of a braid, all the poems that are not poems, regional accents, art in a foreign language, Africa, difficult names, films in which we do not feature, gods that do not look like us, unknown origin. In this case, a library of blank books, paperbacks crowded with horizon, the narrative never quite reached. The books sit with their backs to visitors, tight-lipped. Inside, their pages are bright, white like teeth, like a bank manager's smile. Their stories are stored elsewhere, somewhere with keys. The books no longer speak to the children. When the children leave, their fingerprints web the glass, confiscated contraband. In this case, a young boy is draw drawing. He is trying to sketch the feeling of belonging, but no matter how hard he tries, the ink returns to the pen, 
everything on the page migrates back to its source. When he finishes, his mother and father gather round the empty space and stroke their chins. It's incredible, they agree. Incredible. This looks just like your grandfather. A gift from the HM government. In this case, a row of brown-faced girls seated neatly at the front of a class. They are listening carefully to the teacher who is telling them that they don't exist. They nod softly, take notes, and as they do, gently disappear. Before disappearing, one girl raises her hand. Miss, she says, Miss, if we don't exist, why does everyone stare at us? Don't interrupt, says the teacher. These people, she mutters to herself, these people. Four, newsfeed. The children become teenagers. They are their own art. Here I am, picnic on a polar ice cap, our gingham grins waving. Here I am, holding a tea dance inside an ostrich. We are drinking the last ocean from crystal cut glasses. Here I am, lecturing on language, my tongue a pencil eraser, rubbing out the faces of audience members. Here I am, reciting poetry, all of it rhyming with what came before. Here I am, here I am, here I am. Five, the last song. In the Museum of Museums, the last song flutters in its snow globe, stretches its understanding against the glass, pecks at its reflection, ingests it, throws back its throat and sings the forbidden, a high note, thin as a lockpick, that triggers shock waves across the glass, fault lines fracturing into a wry smile, and through it seeps the song. From far, across the yard, a quiet man who was once a quiet child pauses in his sweeping, tilts a head and marvels, his brush now marking the counterbeat. Thank you very, very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to just uh, wrap us up now. But actually, one of the ways I'd like to do that is I've actually got some words in front of me from um, uh, thinking about what we can do, um, which come from uh, one of the traditional owners, um, a man called Mangu Badajari Yana, who we work with in Australia. Um, and he uh, just shared with me um, what traditional artefacts and the objects in our museums mean for him. And I think they give a really good sense of why we have to tell more stories. So he talked about how um, locked deep within these artefacts is our law, our histories, our traditions, our livelihoods, our stories. And I think of those of us like Njabu and I, um, who work in museums um, and in collaboration with poets like Joel and others, um, I think it's incumbent on us to tell those new stories. So can I say a massive thank you um, to Njabu? <laughs> Thanks. And, and to Joel. And um, yeah, let's keep storytelling. Thank you. Thank you, Esme. Thank you very much.